Yes, I give it a go. So, um, good afternoon, morning or, or evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is uh, Julien Labruyère. I'm, I'm a radiologist, but also one of the two directors at uh, VetCT. And on behalf of the team at VetCT, I hope that you are all well and safe, um, wherever you are. So welcome everyone to this week's summit talk. Um, there is uh, actually an exceptional audience today, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Olga Travetti, who will be speaking about one of her favorite subjects, the MRI of uh, the pituitary gland. Uh, just before, some information for those of you who join us for the first time. There are a few functions at the bottom of the screen I would recommend to use. So if you want to ask a question, just click on the chat button and uh, Anna Adrian, who is our moderator today, will uh, pick up the questions and find a good time to, to ask to, um, to Olga. And you also have a reaction button uh, where you can raise hand or thumbs up uh, as a emoji. So finally, I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone who makes this uh, summit possible. Uh, and in, in particular, Heather Chalmers, uh, Nicole Hearn, and uh, Anna Adrian. Um, as you can imagine, there's a considerable amount of work in, uh, in the background to make these events possible and make sure that uh, that city keeps providing education during those difficult times. So thank you very much. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Olga Travetti. Olga went to vet school in Milan in Italy and continued uh, there in academia for the following years, teaching students and studying for her PhD. She obtained a PhD with a thesis about the imaging aspect of feline injection site sarcomas. She then moved to Ghent in Belgium in 2010, where she completed a residency in diagnostic imaging, and she became an ECVDI diplomat in 2014. She then moved to the UK, where she currently lives and works as a clinical radiologist and also a reporting radiologist for the CT. Olga has authored and co-authored a great number of peer-reviewed articles. Her contribution to the literature includes subjects such as imaging of oral cholesteatoma, safety of contrast ultrasonography, or MRI of the pituitary gland, which is one of her favorite subjects and the topic of today's talk. So with no further ado, I will hand you over the microphone, Olga. Thank you so much for being there, and thank, thank you, you, everyone. OK. So I will share my screen now. Um. OK. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, so thank you everyone for uh, coming here today. Um, I will uh, unshare my screen now, and then uh, I will uh, I will unshare my video now, and then I will uh, pop back at the end. Okay. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about the MRI of the pituitary gland. Um, we will um, briefly uh, remind some uh, physiology and anatomy um, um, aspects that are relevant to the presentation. And we will talk about the appearance of the normal MRI uh, um, of the pituitary gland. And then uh, um, I will give you some um, quick notes and comments about uh, um, um, technical um, aspect of the uh, MRI of the gland. And finally, we will talk about uh, lesions of the pituitary glands. Okay, uh, so here on uh, the left side, on the, on the right side, you can see uh, the skull of um, a dog uh, where the brain and uh, the pituitary gland have been removed. And uh, you can see that we have um, a um, cavity within the sphenoid bone, which is the uh, cella turcica where the pituitary gland lives. And uh, just um, rostral to the gland, uh, we have the optic chiasm. And uh, on the left side, you can see the pituitary gland removed from uh, that skull, uh, where you can uh, see the two parts, adenohypophysis and neurohypophysis. Uh, 
So the adeno hypothesis is the pinkish part and the neuro hypothesis the white part. And the adeno hypothesis is the true glandular part of the gland, whereas the neuro hypothesis is uh, technically not a gland uh, because it's just a storage for uh, vasopressin and oxytocin. Um, some important landmark. Um, here we have uh, MPR reconstructions of the skull uh, in CT, and we can see that the caudal um, margin is the dorsum cell, which is the protuberance in the sphenoid bone, and the rostal margin is the level where the, uh, the presphenoid and the basisphenoid um, uh, meet each other. Um, and uh, this is the rostral limit, let's say, of the cella torsica. And we can see that also on CT, um, MPR, uh, sagittal reconstructed images, we can see uh, the pituitary gland quite well um, in post-contrast imaging. Um, to be remembered that at the level of the dorsum cell, which is the protuberance of the sphenoid bone, uh, there is the oval foramen, which is the foramen through which the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve leaves the skull. And a little bit more rostrally at the level of the gland itself, we have the oval foramen through which the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve leaves the skull. Um, so here, um, again, we can see the same skull uh, that we, we saw before, but with the pituitary gland in place. And uh, on each side of the pituitary gland, we have uh, an important cranial nerve, the oculomotor nerve. Uh, remembering the, uh, the fact that the two are adjacent to each other is important because the oculomotor nerve is uh, very likely to be involved whenever we have a pathology of the cellar region. And as we saw before, um, uh, the optic chiasm is just uh, rostral to the gland. So from the point of view of the meningeal covering, uh, there are two different layers of the dura mater um, involved in the um, um, in the, uh, in the uh, meningeal uh, covering of the cella torsica and pituitary gland. So the external layer, which is here represented with the continuous line, uh, lines the ventral uh, aspect of the cella torsica. And then we have uh, a second layer, the meningeal layer of the dura mater, which is here represented with the dotted line, which um, on one side uh, lines the floor of the cella torsica as the previous, but also um, uh, covers the dorsal surface of the cella torsica. But the covering of the dorsal surface is not complete, there is an opening, and through this opening, the pituitary stalk leaves the cella torsica and runs dorsal to the hypothalamus. The covering is called the diaphragma cell. In between the two layers, there is an empty space, a space called the cavernous sinus, and this extends from the level of the orbital fissure to the level of the petro-occipital canal. And it is um, in, in this cavernous sinus that we have important vascular structures. Um, within the cavernous sinus, we have vessels called the, the cavernous sinuses parallel to the uh, length, to the, to the long axis of the gland, and intercavernous sinuses, which are perpendicular to the previous ones. So <clears throat> this is the stained skull uh, we saw before um, and uh, the brain removed with the pituitary gland in uh, sight. And we can actually see quite clearly um, the attachment of the diaphragma cell to uh, the dorsum cell, um, which is uh, what we thought before, so the, the meningeal covering of the gland. So in a T1-weighted uh, pre-contrast uh, images, the neuro hypothesis is hyperintense uh, in T1. And this is because there, is, uh, um, there are granules of vasopressin within it. Uh, there is a second theory whereby uh, it is hyperintense because of the presence of um, drops of fat, but is actually um, less reliable, less true, because um, if you perform a, a fat sat, like we did here with the pituitary gland, um, in C2, we can see that the hyperintense uh, persists. Uh, so this is a, a short video. I hope you can uh, see it, where I show the uh, relationship between the pituitary stalk, the neuro hypothesis, and the adeno hypothesis. So here I am touching the pituitary stalk, 
neurohypothesis slightly whitish and the adenohypothesis in pink. And here I am grabbing the gland through the pituitary stalk and uh, suspending it in order for you to see uh, the relationship between the three of them. Um, if, you, if you take this um, isolated pituitary gland and you put it in a plastic tube like we did um, and you scan it in a T1, uh, you are still able to um, define the adenohypothesis, uh, the pituitary stalk and uh, um, the neurohypothesis uh, quite clearly. So the middle cranial uh, fossa region um, is very important from the point of view of several uh, cranial nerves. Uh, so we have the oculomotor, uh, the trochlear nerve, the abducent nerve, and also the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, as well as the sympathetic innervation to the eye. All of these structures uh, exit the skull together through the orbital fissure. Um, we have also the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, and we have uh, also parasympathetic fibers that run together with the oculomotor nerve to the pupae. Uh, when we have a parasympathetic damage, we will have mitriasis, whereas when we have a sympathetic damage, we will have meiosis. Um, so the middle uh, cranial fossa syndrome is uh, uh, what was previously called the cavernous sinus um, syndrome. Cavernous sinus is um, more a term used in human medicine and is um, um, composed of ophthalmoplegia uh, or ophthalmoparesis, uh, which is uh, caused by um, a deficit of the third, uh, fourth and sixth cranial nerve. Um, we can have um, internal ophthalmoplegia and external ophthalmoplegia. Uh, the internal ophthalmoplegia uh, happens when we have mainly a damage of the oculomotor nerve and the patient will be in fixed uh, mitriasis, whereas uh, ophthalmo, external ophthalmoplegia or paresis uh, will be when we have a, the concomitant damage of third, fourth and sixth cranial nerves. Um, then we can have uh, sensory loss um, and pain in the region of the face, which is caused by uh, damages to the ophthalmic and maxillary branches of the trigeminal nerve. And then we will have also mitriasis, most commonly. However, if the sympathetic damage predominates, we will have meiosis more rarely. From the point of view of the size, uh, of course, there are several texts that uh, you can consult to um, know what's the normal size of the gland. Um, this is mainly in dogs. Um, ideally, we should always perform a, a pituitary to brain ratio to uh, understand the size of the gland, because of course, uh, the size of the pituitary gland of Pomeranian won't be the same as one of a Great Dane. Um, however, uh, the size of the pituitary gland is not uh, the same throughout life and it varies uh, depending on the, uh, the, the moment of life. So um, in moments where there is a lot of uh, growth going on, for example in newborns, where there is a huge amount of uh, growth hormone uh, to be secreted uh, and also in puberty, uh, the gland will be bigger. And instead, it will be uh, smaller in old people and animals. In old people, it is also reported that the uh, T1-weighted hyperintensity of the neurohypothesis is decreased. And this is believed to be because old people have a uh, lower plasma osmolality. However, in animals, uh, when we see a decreased or absent T1-weighted hyperintensity of the neurohypothesis, the main differential is a central diabetes insipidus. Um, the sequence is uh, most commonly and most usefully used to, uh, to assess the um, cell region are the normal T1 and T2, especially in sagittal and transverse uh, plants. Uh, of course, uh, post-contrast imaging is uh, uh, crucial, particularly um, delayed post-contrast imaging when we have caching. And um, it is particularly useful performing a T1 uh, post-GAD uh, um, in uh, uh, sagittal. Uh, because it is useful when we have uh, the doubt whether or not the gland extends uh, dorsal respect to the dorsum cell. This is useful when there is a subtle increase in size of the gland and we are not sure whether or not it's too big. Uh, 
Finally, we will see it later. There is a rare pathology in dogs called the Ratke cleft cyst, uh, which can be uh, hyper intense in T1 and T2. And therefore, we will need uh, a fat suppression uh, sequence to uh, differentiate with the uh, fat content. So this is a, um, a T1 weighted transverse uh, image at the level of the pituitary gland in a low field magnet. And uh, you will notice that on each side of the gland there, is, there are two uh, hypointense vascular uh, structures. Um, we can also see the same in a, a high field where we can see uh, the T1 weighted upper intensity of the neural hypothesis in the center and then the gland after administration of contrast medium. And we can still see uh, these two vascular structures on each side. So uh, the pituitary gland has a rich vascular supply and uh, most of the uh, arterial supply comes from the internal carotid artery and from the caudal communicating artery. And then each of these send additional smaller branches um, perpendicular that go toward the gland, as you can see here, and form a plexus of very small vessels that is included in the meningeal uh, layering of the gland. From the embryological point of view, uh, the neurohypothesis and the adenohypothesis has two different embryological origin because the neurohypothesis originates from the neural ectoderm and uh, maintains a neuron connect, neural connection with the hypothalamus. Instead, uh, the adenohypothesis originates from a part of the oral ectoderm called Ratke pouch, and this will be important for uh, the origin of the Ratke cleft cyst, and maintains a vascular connection with the hypothalamus. So here we can see a schematic representation um, where we can see in orange what will become uh, the neurohypothesis, and uh, in green uh, what will become the adenohypothesis. And you will see that um, they will um, um, reach each other, um, get closer, and then uh, the adeno hypothesis will somehow um, surround the neuro hypothesis. So uh, we can uh, see here a close up of the pituitary gland in T1 pre contrast, where we can recognize um, at the center in orange uh, the neuro hypothesis and uh, surrounding the neurohypothesis in green, the adenohypothesis. So remembering this is quite important because observing the gland in pre-contrast is already quite a good indication of what is going on. Uh, because um, if a process has started in the adenohypothesis, uh, there will be a mass effect um, onto the neurohypothesis. And this won't be anymore in the center, will be displaced to the right or to the left, or displaced to the uh, displaced dorsally. Uh, instead, when a pathological process will start in the neurohypothesis, there will be a, an interruption of the T1-weighted hyperintensity corresponding to the neurohypothesis, to the, the vasopressing, and we will see a sort of um, filling defect, a, a hyperintensity within the upper intensity. So uh, remembering this is quite important. Um, I, I hope uh, everybody can, can hear me and everything is fine. Uh, Anna? Yes, everything is great. Great, great. I just wanted to double check before I talk <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> okay. Oh, doing great. Thanks so much. So um, uh, the adenohypothesis has a vascular connection with the hypothalamus. Uh, so this uh, happens because the hypothalamus produce uh, peptides and these are released into the median eminence. This is the region of the brain where there is an interruption of the hematoencephalic barrier. And this allows a group of uh, small arteriolus, a plexus of arteriolus called the uh, hypophysial portal vessels to uptake the peptides and transport them to the adenohypothesis. And once the adenohypothesis receives them, releases in the blood um, the hormones. This is why we say that the adenohypothesis arterial supply is delayed because it does come from, um, let's say it's indirect. It's not a direct arterial supply, but it goes through the plexus of the portal vessels. And um, this is actually quite useful for us because uh, we can, uh, um, on CT, 
um, perform, when we perform a dynamic CT uh, of the pituitary gland, um, we will see that the first uh, um, of the two uh, to update the contrast uh, will be the neuro hypothesis. And we will see uh, like here an inverted triangle in the center of the uh, pituitary fossa. And uh, after a few seconds, there will be um, the blood uh, supply to the adeno hypothesis. And we will see a um, either a ring enhancement or a diffuse enhancement of the gland. It is actually useful when we are studying um, the, the, the pituitary gland for um, whether, wondering whether or not there is a microadenoma on CT, uh, because we will see um, that if there is, most likely the neuro hypothesis will be displaced. And this is possible if we, um, if we take benefit of the fact that the two of them uh, appear at different times, because we will be able to see a displacement of the neuro hypothesis before the adeno hypothesis gets vascularized. So um, the neuro hypothesis instead has a neural connection with the hypothalamus. And this happens because um, the, the, the vasopressin and uh, oxytocin are um, actually produced in the, in the bodies of cells that are located in the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei within the hypothalamus. And then the axons of these uh, cells travel through the pituitary stalk, down through the diaphragma cellae, up to the level of the neuro hypothesis. And here they promote the release of the vasopressin granules directly into the bloodstream. The arterial supply um, of the um, neuro hypothesis comes from the caudal hypophyseal artery, whereas the arterial supply to the adeno hypothesis was coming from the rostral hypophyseal artery. Um, so this is a, a very nice article where uh, they have studied the uh, appearance of the pituitary gland in 3D. It is very, uh, very well detailed and um, shows you there is um, the third ventricle, just the dorsal uh, to the gland. And uh, there is a small collection of CSF on each side, the basal cistern. And you can see that also they show very well the coda communicating artery on each side of the, of the pituitary gland. Um, there is uh, also a great detail in uh, sagittal uh, post-contrast um, uh, images because you can check, you can see uh, quite easy, quite uh, nicely the pituitary stalk. And uh, uh, remind that uh, uh, the optic chiasm is just uh, uh, rostro, rostro dorsal to the pituitary stalk. So it is quite um, obvious that when we have a mass effect or a pathology in the region of the cella turstica, we will have most likely um, some visual disturbances because of the presence of the optic eye so close to the gland. So in an ideal situation, uh, you will find yourself uh, um, in uh, what you can see here on the left side. So uh, in T1 pre-contrast, you will see uh, the neuro hypothesis represented as an inverted triangle. But in real life, sometimes we find ourselves in the right side of the screen. So where we are actually the level of the cell turstica, but we don't see uh, the neuro hypothesis in pre-contrast. So this can happen for a series of situations. One could be, well, ideally we want, uh, um, we want uh, to cut the gland just at the level of the middle of the gland. And, uh, and then even in low field, uh, we can actually see uh, quite well uh, the neuro hypothesis. You can see, for example, here, we can see a diffuse hyperintensity and not a very well delineated bright spot. Um, but you can see that the quality of the image is already quite low, so it is understandable. However, sometimes, despite we um, this, sometimes we can't see the neuro hypothesis at all, like in this case. And this can happen uh, because uh, as you can see here um, with the yellow arrow, uh, our uh, slice is actually slightly rostral respect to the gland. Or um, it can happen that our slice is actually slightly uh, caudal respect to the gland. And this is quite um, likely to happen in low field because uh, the slice, thick, slice thickness is likely to be thicker than in, um, than in high field. 
Um, and in a, a toy uh, breed like uh, this one, uh, okay, with very doomed uh, round shaped uh, cranial balls, uh, the cella torsica is really short, so it is easy to skip the gland in between slices. Uh, so make sure that your uh, transverse slice really cuts the gland at the level of the, mid, uh, of the middle. And uh, when in doubt, um, a very useful sequence, as I said already, is a sagittal T1 post contrast. So uh, we are now starting to talk about pituitary lesions and I have divided them in uh, solid and cystic, but this is not the only way to, um, to classify them. It's just that I found it easier. So uh, the most common um, lesion is uh, a solid lesion and it's adenoma. So um, in, in veterinary medicine, we uh, consider uh, microadenomas, all uh, those that are less than one centimeter in size. However, this is a classification that we have inherited from uh, human medicine. Um, and, um, and it can be actually, it has to be taken with um, with some proportions, because of course, the skull of a human being and the skull of a cat are very, very different. Adenomas have um, variable T1 weighted and T2 weighted signal. They are solid lesions and they have uh, minimal enhancement. They are locally, they are, lateral, lateral, they are localized uh, on one side. Uh, this is because, uh, as we said, the glandular portion of the gland is the adenohypophysis, and this surrounds uh, the neuro hypothesis. So when we see the gland in a transverse, the adeno hypothesis is um, around, uh, so it is on each side. Um, so we often see them either uh, on the bottom of the cella torsica or on each side, on one side, but uh, tendentially not in the middle. Um, some examples are prolactinoma and uh, growth hormone secreted, uh, secreting microadenomas. Um, this is a very nice article regarding a prolactinoma in a dog. This dog was presented for uh, galactorrhea. It's a 12-year-old male, your Terrier. And um, um, they administer um, cabergolin and the uh, galactorrhea result. Um, they scanned the brain and they found this uh, mass in the cella uh, tersica. And um, after a while, the dog was uh, put to sleep for another reason, and they um, they found a um, uh, they found a um, uh, macroadenoma of the actually infiltrative macroadenoma of the pituitary gland with immunolabeling for uh, prolactin. Um, so this is a case I, I had, uh, quite interesting. It was uh, a cat um, that was uh, imaged for uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. So in T2 uh, transverse, we can see there is a uh, hypointense nodule uh, on one side in the uh, region of the cella. And um, in T1 pre-contrast, we can see that the hyperintensity corresponding to the neurohypothesis is poorly delineated and is uh, uh, slightly displaced to one side, which is the opposite side respect to where we saw the T2 um, hypo nodule. And uh, uh, performing a T2 star uh, transverse, we could see that uh, in the region of the T2 hypointense uh, uh, nodule, there, is no, there isn't a, a susceptibility artifact, so meaning that we are not in presence of a hemorrhage. The cat had um, a series of other uh, findings. There is this uh, hypointense uh, uh, triangular lesion in the subcortical gray matter of the parietal um, region. And um, this was another problem. Um, then in post contrast, we could see um, that the gland um, on the same side where there was a T2 hypointense nodule has a slight decreased contrast uptake. And this is actually uh, more clearly visible in the dorsal image where we can see a, a clear filling defect at the level um, on, the, on the side where there was the hypo intense nodule. So um, also the, the, the cat had uh, this lesion at the, level, at the level of the cerebellum with strong contrast uptake. So there is a, um, a lot of, of MRI findings in this case. Um, but um, clinically speaking, the, the, the problem in the cat was the uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, which after um, 
several attempts to stabilize uh, was uh, uh, too much and the cat was put to sleep. Um, the main suspicion in this case, because we have a, a, a small lesion within the pituitary gland and we have a cat with uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, was that there was a, a macro, a micro adenoma within the pituitary gland and this micro adenoma was secreting, um, secreting a growth hormone uh, because this can create uh, insulin resistance or um, ACTH secreting because also in case of um, uh, increase the secretion of um, corticosteroids uh, for, for a long time, we can have um, insulin uh, resistance. Um, in this case, uh, uh, the, the necropsy um, confirmed the, the presence of two actually microadenoma in the pituitary gland, uh, but I don't have the immuno label in this case. But this was um, the, the suspicion based on the MRI findings. So this was a second case I had. Um, it was a um, flat-coated retriever uh, with pain opening the mouth. So you can see that um, from the MRI, um, in T1 pre-contrast, uh, the hyperintensity corresponding to um, the neural hypothesis is uh, missing. The dog has also diabetes insipidus, by the way. And uh, in post-contrast, uh, you can see that the, the gland is quite flat and uh, doesn't have uh, uh, proper strong contrast uptake. Um, we can see that in the sagittal T2, there is a hypointense nodule at the level of the gland. So in this case, there is something else going on. Uh, as you can see, uh, the temporal mandibular joint uh, um, has uh, some uh, changes and there is a strong contrast uptake uh, on the left temporal mandibular joint. We have uh, um, FNA this and it turned out as being a suicidal sarcoma. Um, so in this case, um, we, don't, uh, we don't have a post-mortem, but um, some consideration regarding the findings are that um, we have a neoplastic uh, disease uh, in this dog, and we have uh, some problem within um, the neuro hypothesis. So apart from idiopathic diabetes, in central diabetes insipidus, which is a possibility, um, it is possible that this dog had a metastatic nodule uh, within the neuro hypothesis. Um, this is something that can happen in human beings and uh, uh, it's not fully reported uh, in, uh, in veterinary medicine, so it's just a, a, a hypothesis, but it would fit with the fact that the dog had the diabetes insipidus and had a nodule um, within the gland compressing the neuro hypothesis clearly because we don't see the neuro hypothesis in T1. This was the same nodule visible in the dorsal plane. Um, so in this case, we have uh, T2, uh, we have flare, uh, T1 pre-contrast and T1 post-contrast of um, a dog at the level of the gland. So in uh, T2, we can see there is a hyperintense area on one side, and this region does not suppress in flare, which means that we are not in presence of CSF. Um, in T1, it is quite interesting because we can see that the, the region has a intensity similar to the uh, adeno hypothesis, and is a slightly distorting the shape of the neuro hypothesis. And in T1 post contrast, we can see that there is some um, contrast enhancing, um, contrast enhancing pituitary parenchyma just surrounding uh, these um, non enhancing structures. So um, it is quite an incidental finding, and of course, I don't have. Um, uh, I don't have post-mortem because nobody would put to sleep a dog for such a small finding. But anyway, um, uh, in this case, hypothesis is that this is a non-secreting um, microadenoma within the adeno hypothesis, um, or uh, potentially a microadenoma with a very low secretion and uh, creating uh, endocrine imbalance, which is not yet clinically visible. So some sort of subclinical endocrine imbalance. Um, talking about solid lesions, uh, one important is hypophysitis. So hypophysitis is a well-known well um, clinical disease in, uh, in human beings, um, and it can be uh, primary or secondary. So um, in uh, primary hypophysitis, uh, usually it is uh, lymphocytic and it is uh, autoimmune. And this is the most common type. 
um, uh, human beings with hypophysitis have two type of clinical signs. They have on one side what is called the tumoral syndrome, uh, which is uh, basically a mass effect um, and causes them headaches, uh, visual impairment, and sometimes cavernous sinus syndrome. And on the other side, they have endocrine symptoms. Uh, which are characterized by a progressive uh, decrease and finally lack of function of the adenohypophysis and neurohypophysis. So they will have uh, a hypopituitarism uh, that involves uh, uh, the two parts of the gland. Um, why is it important uh, knowing this? Because uh, uh, the role of the radiologist is really crucial. Uh, it is uh, estimated that up to 40% um, of uh, people uh, with hypophysitis um, had to go through um, unnecessary surgery because this was diagnosed as um, macroadenoma, aggressive macroadenoma. Um, so uh, it is actually quite um, not difficult uh, confusing them because they're, very, they're quite similar. Um, however, some, um, different, some, some different things they have is that um, hypophysitis is uh, often uh, symmetrical. Uh, so this is not uh, often the case with microadenomas, which are irregular heterogeneous, and they can have, uh, hypophysitis can have symmetrical contrast uptake as well. Um, also, something useful is that um, to remember is that uh, often when we have a macroadenoma, this um, displaces the neurohypophysis, uh, but the neurohypophysis uh, still uh, somehow remains able to uh, secrete uh, vasopressin. And this is something that doesn't happen with hypophysitis because hypophysitis is an aggressive inflammatory process targeting the gland. So before or after, the dog will have diabetes insipidus. Um, I didn't know any of this when I saw this case, and I was actually quite puzzled. Um, so we had this uh, Scottish terrier uh, with one week history of uh, lethargy and anorexia. And uh, at the neuro uh, exam, um, they found uh, a suspected lesion in the uh, forebrain, and uh, there was a uh, T2-weighted hyperintense uh, lesion in the, in the cellar and paracellar region. And um, in T1, we can see that the hyperintensity uh, corresponding to the neurohypophysis is somehow poorly delineated. And interestingly, we can see a intense and symmetrical contrast uptake at the level of this uh, suspected mass in the cellular region. So at the time, um, there was the tentative diagnosis of the cellular mass, uh, but um, the dog went through further testing and they found uh, some uh, sign of secondary hypothyroidism and secondary hypoadrenocorticism. So for the moment, the suspicion was that we had um, adenohypopituitarism and neurohypopituitarism, secondary to a suspected uh, pituitary mass. Quite quickly, the dog deteriorated markedly um, and uh, during the same uh, night or the day after, unfortunately died. Uh, so at the moment of the uh, necropsy, uh, the, patho the pathologist tell, told that she couldn't find any pituitary mass. And even more, she couldn't find the pituitary gland at all. So she, um, she was able to do histopath on uh, some fragments of the pituitary gland she found. And uh, she found an intense uh, dramatic inflammation. So this was described as a panhypophysitis, so a hypoinflammation targeting both parts of the gland, and hypothalamitis of probable autoimmune origin. So this was an um, autoimmune uh, hypophysitis. So um, um, in the aftermath, when you look at the T2 uh, SAGE, uh, we can definitely say that uh, there is uh, extension into the hypothalamus. And uh, it makes quite sense that when we have an autoimmune uh, inflammatory disease that targets the hypothesis, also the hypothalamus can be involved because as we remember, the neurohypothesis has a neural connection with the hypothalamus, they are connected. The cell bodies that produce uh, um, vasopressin are located in the hypothalamus. And so it makes complete sense that when we have an auto autoimmune hypophysitis, we can have an autoimmune hypothalamitis.
So this is another very interesting article. Uh, it's very recent where they had a dog, um, one year old, presenting with uh, um, acute subacute onset of blindness, ataxia, and polyuria polydipsia. They did an MRI of the brain and they found a pituitary mass. So as you can see also in this case, the mass is quite symmetrical. Um, the contrast uptake uh, um, is pretty homogeneous. You can tell that the mass is extending rostral and dorsal to the pituitary gland, and you can tell there is an involvement of the optic chiasm from the sagittal, so uh, the blindness makes absolute sense. Um, so they started um, the process of putting this dog under radiation therapy, and before that they needed the, the, gland, the, the mass to shrink, so they gave corticosteroids. And the dog had a complete resolution of the neurological and visual deficits. Um, so um, this is how they repeated imaging and they saw that actually the mass uh, was uh, reducing and then the dog uh, resolved completely, recovered completely. So you understand this is extremely interesting because um, it makes such a massive difference uh, diagnosing a hypophysitis and a macroadenoma because of the incredible design could make for the life of the dog or cat. Okay, so um, a quite interesting but rare uh, pathology in uh, um, dogs and cats is Ratke cleft cysts. Ratke cleft cysts are actually quite common in human beings, and they are described as being either intracellular or supracellular. In the intracellular type, um, the, 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 the cyst is in close contact with the posterior lobe on the midline, whereas in the supracellular, uh, the cyst is uh, sitting on a gland like an egg in, the, in an egg and a cat configuration. So you have to imagine the ratke cleft would be the egg and the pituitary gland would be the cap. So um, they are cystic structures, but they can be hyperintense in T1 and T2 because the fluid is rich in mucus and proteins. And this is why if you see a suspected uh, cystic structure, which is also hyperintense in T1, uh, you may want to perform a fat saturation sequence to differentiate respect to the presence of fat. And something uh, quite interesting is that in um, human beings, in many cases, we have intracystic nodules, which are the, is the one I'm showing he, here with the uh, red arrow, uh, composed of protein and cholesterol. And these are avascular, they don't enhance, and they are hypointense in T2. And if you see one of them in a suspected ratke cleft cyst, it's quite, it's quite typical. Um, so um, this is a nice case report of a dog, um, one of the few I could find where there was this uh, T2 hyperintense, uh, T1 hyperintense uh, lesion in the cellular region with a, a peripheral contrast uptake, but only the ventral part, interestingly. And, um, and this um, was also visible on uh, necropsy. Uh, because there was the cyst and some pituitary parenchyma lining the ventral aspect of the cyst. And, um, and this was a confirmed uh, Ratke cleft cyst. Um, the configuration of the egg uh, and egg and cap, you can see here. And you can see also the enhancement of the pituitary parenchyma uh, ventral to the cyst. So I had a, a case um, um, where I potentially suspected the presence of a ratke, clef, uh, ratke cleft cyst. This was a, a bulldog, six year old, with seizures and visual impairment. Uh, there is this, um, apart from, have, there is obviously a lesion in the, in the cellular region with uh, uh, hyperintense in T2 and, um, and in T1 with some definitely uh, marked homogeneous contrast uptake, which was suspected as being a paracellular meningioma, but there is also a lesion in the cellular region, um, which is hyperintense in T1, hyperintense in T2. Um, and this, uh, there is also this uh, T2 weighted um, ISO2 hyperintense um, nodule within the, the cyst without contrast uptake. And then after administration of contrast medium, we could see that the, basically the, the floor of the cellular torsica had um, some contrast uptake. So I was really, really excited in this case because I thought I found the radical cyst. Unfortunately, it's not confirmed uh, because uh, when the pathologist opened the skull, um, there was obviously this big meningioma. And I think what might have happened is that because this is a cystic structure, it ruptured at the moment of um, taking out 
basically a domain in JOMA from the base of Pascal, and they couldn't find uh, the liquid anymore. So it's not confirmed, but um, yeah, it could have been. <laughs> um, so um, cysts, uh, um, cystic lesions, we are talking now about cystic lesions and particular cysts without, within the neurohypothesis, which in, in human beings is called the posterior uh, lobe. So there are often incidental findings um, and they are cystic lesions. So they are T1 weighted hypointense, T2 hyperintense. And because they originate within the neurohypothesis, they are surrounded by vasopressin. So they are surrounded by a thin rim of T1-weighted hyperintense signal. In human beings, they can expand quite a lot in time. So in human beings, they uh, advise to repeat imaging to make sure they don't enlarge too much and uh, compress the gland. So here you can see uh, quite clearly a T2-weighted hyperintense uh, area within the pituitary gland. And this is uh, uh, not suppressing in flare. And in T1, we can see that um, this, hypo, uh, this high T2 hyperintense structure is a T1 hypo and is surrounded by a rim of hyperintensity. And when we administer the contrast, we can see that um, the central hyperintensity stays uh, while the rest of the gland enhances. And uh, the fact that we have um, some vasopressing lining uh, this central hypointensity, it means that we are inside the um, neurohypothesis and we have a cystic lesion. So it's a posterior or neurohypophysial uh, cyst and it is a complete incidental finding. Um, so finally, um, I would like to talk about dermoid and epidermoid cysts. Um, which, are, which have something in common because both of them are congenital and are uh, caused by inclusion of ectodermal tissue during closure of the neural tube. Um, the difference is that dermoid cysts uh, often contain fat, so they are hyper intense in T1 and T2, so you may want to perform a T1 fat sat to um, make sure it is fat. In CT they are um, hypointense and the main differential uh, is lipoma. Uh, inside the moid cyst you can find teeth, you can find calcification. Instead, um, epidermoid cysts, uh, they locate mainly at the level of the cerebellopontine angle but rarely can be cellular and they are hypointense in T1, hyper in T2 and they have no enhancement and apart from the location in the cerebellopontine angle are characterized typically by this cauliflower irregular appearance. And these are the two, two of the many articles um, I found about this. So a dermoid cyst here, hyperintense in T1 and in T2, and the epidermoid cyst here with a typical cauliflower appearance at the level of the Sabella Pontine angle, so quite typical. So because I mentioned many lesions, I, I thought I would make a summary. Um, of the pituitary lesions. Um, so microadenomas are um, solid lesions and because they are uh, originating from the glandular part of the gland, they are located within the adenohypothesis. So they're often lateralized. Um, Ratke cleft cysts are rare in animals but can occur. Um, and these are uh, large masses with uh, strangely little mass effect. They can contain T2-weighted hypointense nodules. Uh, they are often uh, hyperintense both in T1 and in T2. And they are located at the level of the midline because this is a uh, basically a problem during um, the formation of the gland. Um, then we have low uh, cysts within the neurohypothesis. These are cystic lesions and uh, they are surrounded by a rim of T1 weighted hyperintensity, vasopressing, and they are located within the neurohypothesis. Metastatic nodules are quite uh, uncommon, but they can uh, occur in the pituitary gland. And in this case, they tendentially locate within the neurohypothesis. And because these are space occupying lesions within the neurohypothesis, they may be associated with central diabetes insipidus. Then we have macroadenomas. 
uh, which are, as we all know, uh, big lesions causing mass effect uh, with asymmetrical con contrast uptake, uh, heterogeneous. Cellular meningiomas, uh, as all meningiomas, same characteristic, um, with a dual tail, with a marked contrast uptake, intense contrast uptake as well. Then we have hypophysitis, which are apparently sometimes um, even similar to masses in the, in the, in the cellular region. However, um, dif uh, this, um, uh, the difference with respect to macroadenomas is that they, they have this homogeneous, sometimes even symmetrical um, contrast uptake. Um, and, um, and then we have a dermoid cysts, which have fat content and are located at the level of the midline. And the epidermoid cysts, which are tendentially located at the level of the cerebellopontine angle and have this uh, lobulated cauliflower-like appearance. And finally, we have craniopharyngiomas, which I haven't had the time to speak about, uh, but these are aggressive lesions um, with brain invasions and often with calcifications. So um, to conclude, um, whenever you are imaging uh, the pituitary gland with a uh, low field MRI, Remember to um, double check your alignment uh, with the sagittal plane to make sure that you have at least uh, one transverse uh, slide into an NT2 at the level of the gland. And observe the appearance of the gland uh, in pre-contrast images as well, because the displacement of the neurohypothesis can tell you a lot about microscopic disease within uh, the gland. Uh, for size and contrast uptake, um, be, um, remind, remind the fact that we can have a uh, decrease the contrast uptake of the gland in the region where we have a microadenoma. So this is something to uh, look. And uh, whenever you find uh, a, um, a change in the pituitary gland that is uh, very small uh, and you are not sure whether or not it's relevant, um, inform the internist and try um, to weigh the importance of the, of the MRI finding based on the clinical presentation, on the fact that the dog has or not uh, some um, subclinical endocrine uh, imbalances. And this was my last slide. Um, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs> and I would be very glad to, um, to answer any question you might have. Thank you so much, Olga, for this great presentation. There's actually one question. Yeah. For the PB ratio calculation in CT, for the measurement of the brain circumference, should one include the pituitary in it or trace the measurement around the gland? Um, well, I would probably not include it um, because uh, I would say that the pituitary gland, as we said, is a technically extradural. So um, I wouldn't include it. Uh, perfect, thank you very much. Um, there's a second question. Is a dermoid cyst the only differential to consider when fat is present at this level? No, uh, it's not the only. Uh, you can, um, so if you have a lesion that has uh, um, fat in it, you can also include the lipoma. Um, they are described in uh, the brain, in human beings, and apparently 10% of these uh, are located in the cellular region. Very interesting. Thank you. Are there any questions? Oh, yep, yeah, there is um, there's a comment. Hi, Olga, thank you. Do you always consider hypophysitis as a possible differential for a pituitary mass? Uh, no, 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 not always. So, um, as I said, there are some MRI characteristics, the symmetry of the mass and the fact that uh, there is an intense homogeneous and symmetrical contrast uptake. And this is for the um, imaging part. For the clinical part, um, often dogs with hypophysitis have an acute or subacute presentation and uh, they have before or, or later, at some point in the process, diabetes insipidus. So suspecting a hypophysitis without any sign of diabetes insipidus clinically, I think is um, a little bit of a stretch. Also uh, talking to the internist and trying to understand whether or not this dog is sick for a long time, um, because macroadenomas are really slow growing. So, um, you may have a clue 
um, finding out whether or not it's a new problem or, the, or, or is an old problem. Great, thank you. There's, um, there's a follow-up question to that. Would you expect the hypophysitis more in young animals? Um, not necessarily. It's an autoimmune disease, but it can um, happen at any time. Uh, personally speaking, uh, I saw two cases and they were both adult. And uh, the nice case report uh, is one year old dog. So I, I'm not sure in veterinary medicine we have enough data to have, uh, you know, the information to say is it more common in young or adults. Thank you. So um, we had a comment. Then, first of all, uh, there was two comments that this was great. Thank you. And then the next one, wonderful presentation. Love the anatomic details. Thank you. And then there's a, um, there are two more questions. So we, uh, one is we commonly perform brain CTs for radiation therapy planning. And I have seen a few cases of empty cellar syndrome. I usually assume it's an incidental finding, but in the literature, sometimes it is mentioned that animals may be clinical. What is your personal experience? So um, empty cella is uh, reported uh, to be incidental. Um, and uh, I also consider it incidental when I don't have any clinical suspicion of pituitary disease. And uh, it is actually uh, not uncommon at all to see an empty cella in a toy or small breed dog. Great. Um, thank you. And then one question, great presentation. If you are scanning a possible diabetes insipidus patient and on fat suppressed images, there's a hyper intense focus in the neurohypothesis. Can you rule out diabetes insipidus? Okay, in fat suppression, there is a T1 hyper. Okay, um, no, I cannot rule out the central diabetes insipidus even when I see the neurohypothesis because the fact that I do have the granule of um, vasopressin within the neurohypothesis doesn't necessarily mean that the neurohypothesis is released. So there might be an interruption in the transport of the hormone, even if the hormones are stored there, unfortunately. So I think still for central diabetes insipidus, which by the way, my dog has, um, the, the only thing is clinical response to desmopressin. Perfect, thank you. So, wow, there's so many, um, thank you, Rose, now. Wow, this was fantastic. Great presentation, thank you so much. And one is also basically saying MRI becomes easy with you, Olga, so that's <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So, yes, lots of thank yous. I'm not reading any questions at this point, so, while you guys are still maybe writing, um, I thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Um, and thank you, Olga, for this great presentation. It was actually truly amazing and learned a lot. Thank you. Um, our next summer talk is on May 20th, so next week. And we're switching over to equine imaging. Dr. R Rachel Murray is talking about the MRI appearance and clinical relevance of pathologic changes in the equine fetlock region. And you should have gotten an email today. So there's a, when you click on that button, you can register for that meeting. And with that, I am just scrolling one more time through the chat to make sure I'm not missing any questions. Um, I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day, evening, morning, as Julian said, depending on in which time zone you are. And um, have a wonderful day. I'm gonna switch on my camera too, like Olga does. 